Hans Nieman is leading the Jerba Masters Tournament after five rounds. He has scored three and a half points, two wins, three draws, very solid performance. And in round six, Hans is playing against the reigning World Juniors champion. It's a really big game, very important. And let's see if Hans is able to take revenge from that loss. Earlier this year at the Tata Steel Challengers Tournament, he lost a very interesting endgame against the Frenchman. But now, new game, new chances, and Hans has very good chances to win the tournament. So let's see how he is doing in this game. He is playing with the white pieces and he starts with the move 1e4. Then the move c6, we have a Karl Kahn opening. Knight f3, d5 and Hans goes for a very modern line. He played here the move d3. Now this looks like a beginner's move at first, but it's actually one of the most promising ways to uh, try to get a playable po position against this uh, very solid opening. After taking the pawn on e4, d takes e4, black can now just exchange queens and well then white is no longer able to castle. The king is stuck in the center, but okay, that's not a big deal. White has a small space advantage in the center, so that's everything well, pretty, pretty normal, I would uh, say. After knight f6, the pawn is under threat. And here, interesting uh, move. This is still well-known uh, theory. Probably both guys even prepared it. Um, and Hans played here the move knight fd2. This looks like anti-developing move, but what you would like to do is to get that knight over to the queen side at some point, maybe to c4 or b3. But first, you also got to play the move f3 to overprotect your pawn with the move f3. The pawn on e4 is nicely defended. But, okay, having placed the knight on d2, okay, the bishop on c1 cannot be developed. So things are a little bit uh, slow now. Black is grabbing space on the king side with the move g5. So the idea is that if white is ever going to play this move f3, then g4. Is going to be played with quite some nice prospects for black to uh, to generate some uh, activity on that side of the board. But instead of f3, Hans played here the move a4. Now it's his turn to grab space on the other side of the board. And black also continues with h5. Both sides are at the moment not really developing their uh, their pieces. But okay, that's not a, not a problem. It's a relatively quiet position. Now the queens have been uh, exchanged. So here, knight c3 played and black play the move h4. Here you can see that uh, black at some point may even consider moves like e, uh, h3 to uh, to generate some uh, pressure on the king side. And interestingly, this exact position was reached in an earlier game of Hans at the World Blitz Championships. He played against a player from Iran, Daneshvar. And okay, even though it was a Blitz game, it's clear that Hans wanted to improve upon that game. In that game, he played the move f3, but then the knight can come to, uh, to h5. Later on, the knight can come to f4, and well, there's definitely some uh, nice play on the dark squares for black. So here, Hans deviates, play the move h3, knight h5 played anyway, and the big difference is shown here because now, because that pawn is not on f3, the knight can go there hitting the pawn on g5 with both the bishop and the knight on f3. So black is forced here to play f6, not to lose a pawn. But here Hans's idea is to play the move e5, putting pressure on that pawn chain. And after taking on e5, you can take on g5 and they're all weak pawns and uh, black is in big trouble. So black is not going to take here yet. He played here the move knight d7 to challenge that pawn on uh, e5. White played here the move a5, not minding black capturing that, uh, that pawn, which was played in the game. Knight takes e5, knight takes e5, pawn takes, and here... White captures on g5. And if you look at the pawn structure, well, these pawns here, like in the other line, they are just really weak. But why is black opting for this particular variation? Well, he's aiming for peace activity. Bishop f5 is played. That's a nice square for the bishop. And if white would take that pawn on h4, then rook d8 will come. And with the rook and the bishop, you're exerting pressure in, uh, against the king, against the pawn on c2. And if you really try to stick to your pawn, let's say king to c1, there's bishop h6 check, king b1, and the rook comes in. And well, this is not a lot of fun. I think black is uh, doing absolutely uh, fine here. So therefore, Hans is not interested in taking the pawn yet. Instead, he played here the move rook a4. That's also one of the advantages, having advanced your pawn to a5. The rook is now fantastically placed on the fourth rank, hitting that pawn on h4. Black, castled, queenside, with check. 
the king gotta go away and now black defends against the threats by putting the knight on f4. Now after bishop takes f4, e takes f4, of course the pawn on f4 can't be taken because of bishop h6 and white is gonna lose that rook on f4 because of uh, a pin. So instead, after taking once on f4, white played here to move bishop e2. So that after e6, the knight comes to e4, it's defended by the rook, so that's looking great. The rook comes to d5, white places the bishop on f3, and there's a nice control over the e4 square. Black is having the bishop pair, but still, there are also weak pawns. So I think the position is more or less balanced here so far. Bishop e7, and the knight goes back to d2 to attack. The rook on d5 with the bishop, the bishop um, hits the rook, the rook goes back to d7 and now still the pawn on f4 can't be taken here because of bishop g5 with a huge pin. Once again you're winning material as black. So once again white cannot take one of the weak pawns. Rook e1 is played so finally that rook also joins play and rook goes to uh, g8 putting pressure Along this uh, file um, against the pawn on uh, g2, well, everything is still defended, but it also means that the bishop uh, should stay there and doesn't have the opportunity to trade itself off against uh, black's uh, bishop on f5. Knight b3 played, a6, so that uh, you never have to uh, be concerned about moves like uh, a6 by white. King b1, the king is going to a safer square, so that you're preparing to take the pawn on f4, but now it's rook f8. And once again, black indirectly defends the pawn on f4. This time, rook takes f4 is met by bishop takes c2. And you do win the exchange after white captures, the rook on f4 can be taken. White played rook e2, protecting the second rank. King c7 played, the rook goes to c4, the bishop goes to d6. So now the pawn is defended uh, by, the, by the bishop. Knight to d4, but it looks as if white is making a bit of progress here. The knight is looking great, putting pressure against the bishop and the pawn. So maybe white is about to, to win a pawn here. Well, if you do play rook f6, looks as if everything is well protected still. But for some reason, um, the move king b8 was, uh, was played here. Getting out of the c file. There are no tactics here at, uh, at this point. But you do give up a pawn on e6. If you take with the bishop, well, then the rook takes back. That's a healthy pawn. Rook f6, the knight goes back to d4, but on the other hand, you can also say that, okay, the pawn on e6 was not such a great pawn anyway, and, well, the two pawns of black, they are still having a massive grip on the king side, white is kind of unable to, uh, to make uh, any progress, to create a passed pawn on that side, and, well, bishop g6 is played, but interesting moment as both players overlooking the strongest Continuation, according to the machine, as apparently knight takes c6, a spectacular knight sacrifice is incredibly strong. Very difficult to see. One idea is that after taking the knight, rook takes c6, white is having now a second pawn for the piece, also threatening to take the pawn on uh, a6, and, uh, well, especially this pin is very unpleasant. If you try to unpin yourself here with the move bishop uh, e7, well, there is rook takes e7. That's a cool move. As now, whatever black does, the other rook can be taken. If you take on e7, it's rook takes f6. And white is now three pawns up. So, as you can see, after the piece sacrifice, probably black should play something like king a7. But after rook d2, these pins are really annoying. And I don't really see a good way for black to get out of it. Anyway, it's very difficult to uh, see that from afar and it's very understandable that both players uh, didn't consider it. So, in the game, there followed the move bishop g4, hitting the rook. The rook goes back and now the knight comes to f3, hitting the pawn on h4. But the bishop goes to c7 with the idea that if the pawn is taken, well, there is rook d1 check and after king a2, there's another pin on the rook. So, you see so many lines where the bishops are annoying the, one of the, the white rooks. So there's once again no time to take a weak pawn. What should white do instead? Well, the pawn on a5 is hanging and something like b4 looks quite sensible to uh, bring up a pawn and uh, be free with your rook to go wherever you want. But instead, Hans played here to move rook a4. For me, this looks kind of anti-positional. You don't want to defend. Uh, that pawn on a5, uh, making your rook much more passive. And after bishop f7, well, 
Rook d1 is a mating threat because the bishop covers d a2 square. The king can't go there. b3 played so that the king can go to b2 if, ne if, if it's needed. Rook to d5, hitting the pawn on a5. So after knight takes h4, rook takes a5 at least. Black is getting back one pawn, rook takes a5, bishop takes a5, but the game is getting sharper. Both sides are having a pawn majority on uh, their stronger wing. Knight f3 play, the knight comes back, bishop c3. Bishop looks fantastic here on uh, c3, and after h4, the rook comes in to d6. So the idea is to stop the h pawn. If you advance the pawn, it's rook d1, king a2, rook a1 with checkmate, thanks to this bishop, but also the bishop has some other very important role to stop the h-pawn from queening anytime soon. Let's see what happens because the game is heating up at this point. King c1, rook d5. Now the rook is trying to get um, an entry via the other side. Rook e4, attacking the pawn. Rook a5, threatening checkmate. So the king has to go away. But it's not clear what white is... Um, really going to do with uh, with its king well black first is uh, giving a check on uh, a1 maybe not the best move but difficult to to evaluate after king e2 the idea is to go rook a2 and win that pawn on uh, c2 if you ever go king to d3 whether well, ideas with bishop g6 so the king can't go to that uh, diagonal rook takes f4 is played and now black has a choice he can take the pawn on c2 you can also Take first on b3, which probably comes down to the to the same. The pawn on c2 obviously can't take the bishop. King to d3, rook takes c2. Look at this insane position. What is going on here? Both sides have three passed pawns on their uh, own uh, stronger side. So who is coming first? It looks as if the h pawn is faster. On the other hand, black is having two bishops, which are able to um, defend the pawns from distance, support their own pawns at the same time. But first, white goes for the move bishop e6, annoying this bishop on b3. If you take the bishop, it's king takes c2. So black can't allow that. Moved the bishop away to a1, so that after bishop takes b3, rook c3, king d2, rook takes b3, at least you're winning back the bishop. And now it's just a bishop versus a knight. But white starts pushing the pawn. The h-pawn looks strong, but it's still controlled by the bishop on a1. F fantastic sharp endgame we have here. And, well, some, some very exciting things are about to happen. So let's have a look. Rook b2 check, king e3, rook to b3. Black is offering a repetition of moves. If you ever play the move king e4, it will be easier for black to cross the fourth rank with the pawn because the rook is no longer controlling that fourth rank. Well, king e2 was played and after rook b2, the knight interfered on d2. Now the bishop on a1 is temporarily blocked by its own rook. Rook a2 played and... Well, now the bishop is back in defense, but can you run with the pawn? Well, Hansfeld, I need to play here the move king d1 to deal with the threat of bishop c3 winning the knight. However, if you do play this move h6, bishop c3 can be met by this incredible resource king d3. You're getting out of the pin. You're threatening to take the bishop. If you take that knight on d2, it's rook f8 check. And after king a7, for instance, there's h7 and the pawn is out of reach. The bishop is not back in time, cannot go to c3 to control the greening square. A very big chance for Hans to convert this advantage. But he went to d1. Now, if you ever play bishop c3, knight can come to e4 with tempo. So this was not played and instead the move a5 was played by Maurizi. h6, a4 g4 is played very interesting idea because maybe it's better not to push the pawn to h7 too fast but instead after the move a3 you can put the pawn on g5 so what white is planning to do is g6 and g7 so you're not going to queen your h pawn but maybe your g pawn let's see how this works out bishop c3 attacking the knight on d2 and where should the knight go to not easy at all, but it looks as if knight b3 is the way to go. The knight can try to stop the pawn. If you now, for instance, play rook b2 to make space for your pawn and hit the knight, well, white is just faster 
G6, Rook takes B3, G7, the pawn is about to queen. After Bishop takes G7, H takes G7. Well, if you push the pawn, then White is queening with check. Game over. If you instead play the move Rook B1, well, there's King C2, Rook G1, and White is once again promoting first because the Rook is helping with a check. G8 queen, and after take take, well, the king is able to stop the A pawn. Looks like this was not too difficult to calculate, but I'm not sure how the time situation was at this point. Instead, Hans decided to go with the knight to e4 to hit the bishop, but now the bishop goes to e5. Still, white is in good shape if he just plays the move rook f5 to hit the bishop. And well, things are not that simple. One important defensive idea is that if you try to ignore white's threat, and let's say play rook a1, it's king c2, and if you play a2, obviously there's no time to take the bishop. The rook will go away and the pawn will be promoted. But by placing the king on b3, the rook can never easily go away because then the pawn on a2 will be taken. Remember that defensive uh, idea. And if you can eliminate the pawn, then well, the two remaining connected past pawns, they, they should do the job. Instead, Hans was running with the pawn to g6. His idea is that the rook cannot be taken. Then there's g7 and once again white is promoting its pawn faster. Rook a1 played. Very important idea. Where should the king go? Well, Hans goes into the wrong direction. The king should go to the weaker side. Once again, if you play a2, then first you can save your rook. And after king a7, the king once again can come to b3 and white is all right. But... Hans played the move king to e2, but now there are no defenders to stop that a pawn. After the move a2, g7 is played. Rook g1. And now, what is white gonna do? If you play rook fa check with the idea to promote your own pawn, then black just give, gives up its rook and then promote its uh, other pawn, and black is just completely winning with an extra queen. But Hans played here the move knight g3, interfering on the g file. And after a1 queen, black is promoting first. Maybe Hans was thinking after g8 queen, he's promoting with check and he has the initiative. But after king a7, there are no good checks. It's now all of a sudden a razor sharp position with major pieces on the board. And black's king is much safer than white's because black to move would probably go for queen d1. And after uh, king e3, there's rook e1. And that's exactly what happened in the game. After queen c4, black can even take that rook on f4, but queen d1 is just easier. King e3, rook e1 check, the king has no squares to go to, the only move is knight e2. But here, simple simplification, rook takes e2, white resigned. If you take the rook, then you can take first on f4 with check. And after uh, taking the bishop, well then the queen can be taken, so that's not gonna help. Well, in case of king f3, well, the queens are coming off the board. You take the pawn on h6, your bishop up with two pawns, black is winning. So, an incredible game. And once again, a good reminder for all of us that once the queens are coming off the board, that the position is still potentially very sharp. So many little tactics in this game. And Maurizi once again tricked Hans Niemann after beating him in an endgame in Wijk aan Zee in January, now in February. He is tricking him in this uh, fantastic endgame. Do you like this game? If you have any questions, let me know in the comments what you think of this game. And I would really appreciate if you subscribe to the channel. So if you like it, make sure to become a subscriber and follow the channel. Stay tuned for more exciting content.